刻むでハモンのビート After over a year since the ending of Jojolian in August of 2021, we have finally reached the beginning of a new era for Jojo. Part 9 of the series, titled The Jojo Lands, debuted this month on February 17th in Japan. I really cannot understate how good it feels to be able to say that, since this is a brand new opportunity for a lot of people. Most American Jojo fans have had yet to witness the beginning of a part, and that's finally happened for so many people, including myself. Not only that, but my expectations still manage to be surpassed by what I think is an excellent start. So let's move on and take a look at the first chapter of the JoJo Lands titled Mechanism. One of the most common questions I see people ask is where to read or get updates on new chapters. As it stands, there are three translation groups for the JoJo Lands. First is Hiwamata Noboru, who worked on translating Jojolian as it released. The second is We Need More Yankees, the group that's been translating Crazy Diamond's Demonic Heartbreak for the past year. And the third is Dog Park, who also worked on Jojolian and a retranslation of Stone Ocean. All of these are good options for reading. Each of these groups have websites, Twitter accounts, or discords to join for updates. You can also join the Haman Beat Discord and you'll get a notification when the chapter is released with links to all three of these. Before the actual story, we have a colored introductory page that goes over the concept of stands. It says, There exist powers that have a form and shape, but cannot be seen. They are called stands. They have always existed everywhere. Those who cannot see them are simply not trying to. The quote is credited to a certain mangaka. Next is the colored version of the preview we received that showed the protagonist alongside a boat. With it is a sort of tagline for the series. This is the story of a boy in the subtropical islands who becomes extremely rich. This was shown in the marketing for the story and appears multiple times throughout the chapter. It reminds me of two quotes from early on in Steel Ball Run and Jojolian. In part 7, Johnny says, This story is the tale of me starting to walk. And in Jojolian, Yasuho says, This is a story about breaking a curse. Both of those are quite literal descriptions of their respective plots. However, as we know, both stories are more complex, and those phrases can take on different meanings later in the story. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the deceptively simple story of getting rich turns out to be more complicated. One more thing to note is that at 69 pages, this is the single longest chapter in the main JoJo series. It passed the previous record of Steel Ball Run Chapter 25, with 66 pages back in 2005. With how this chapter is structured, it would be too much to simply go through chronologically, since it's so dense with new information and I have so much to say about it. So I think the best place to start would be the premise. I would say what the story reminds me most of is American crime movies like Pulp Fiction or Jackie Brown. A short summary would be that the main group of characters are drug dealers working out of a fashion boutique run by their high school principal and are tasked with stealing an expensive diamond. As people were able to figure out before the release, the story takes place across the islands of Hawaii. The time period is unclear, but it's most likely set in 2023, much like how Jojolian was set in the year it released. Multiple modern-day references are made, such as to the COVID-19 pandemic and the singer Dua Lipa getting mentioned. We saw Araki write a story set in the pandemic last year with the Rohan chapter Hot Summer Martha. The Jojo Land seems to be a bit later on in the time scale, so I say 2022 or 23 are the most likely periods. Our main character this time around is Jodio Joestar, the grandson of this universe's Joseph. Araki has stated before that Joseph was shown at the end of Part 8 in order for Part 9 to follow up on that by showing his descendants. First of all, I have to say, the name Jodio is definitely funny, but I think it also works to describe his character. Much like how Giorno in Part 5 is considered a combination of Jonathan and Dio, Jodio is a similar kind of character. I'd say he isn't explicitly based on any other character, but he is definitely morally grey compared to most JoJo protagonists. While some comparisons to Giorno are obvious, like them both being criminals, Jodio sets himself apart in a few ways. First of all, he, as well as the other characters, seem to have no qualms whatsoever about dealing drugs, which was the big thing Giorno was against. 
Another contrast would be that Jodeo has a good relationship with his mother. This serves as his main motivation, with him and his sibling working as criminals in order for their mom to have an easy life where everyone respects her. It's very similar to Giorno's backstory, where after helping the gangster, everyone in town was nice to him. So that's the main kind of duality with the character. He does bad things, but also has a completely selfless goal. I also think that Jodeo is one of the most legitimately funny Jojo protagonists, and he makes an amazing first impression. His main goal is, of course, to make money, and at times he seems to be completely full of himself. It makes me wonder how that might change over the course of the story when he encounters something that is an actual threat. Our secondary lead is Jodeo's sibling, Dragona Joestar. The most apparent thing in discussion about Dragona at the moment is that their gender is up for question. My first instinct would be to say that Dragona is a trans woman, but at this point even the translators aren't really sure what to make of it. There's an excellent blog post by one of the translators that goes into this. Dragona themselves speaks with feminine personal pronouns like Atashi. However, Jodeo so far has only referred to them as male, calling them his big brother. Jodeo isn't exactly a completely reliable narrator, so it's possible that he doesn't fully know what Dragona's gender identity is. Dragona is described as liking girly fashion and receives cosmetic injections to their chest. As for Dragona's actual gender, that would obviously be up to the character themselves. So far, Jodeo is really the only person who has had any kind of comment about it, so I don't think we'll know for sure until we get some more of Dragona talking about it from their perspective. I think it's definitely possible that Dragona's gender identity is something that the story will get deeper into and be addressed as part of their character arc. Some people have also speculated that Araki may be making a reference here to Mahu, a third gender that is present in native Hawaiian and Tahitian cultures, literally meaning in the middle. We don't know if that's actually what's happening here, but it is an interesting idea to consider and would make sense with the setting. In the past, Araki has stated that with the character Anasui in Part 6, he intended for him to be a character that exists beyond gender, hence why his gender seemed to change and he had an androgynous appearance. He didn't fully commit to this idea, however, and Anasui is, for all intents and purposes, a man in Stone Ocean. So maybe now that the social climate has changed a bit, Araki might have more room to explore that kind of character again. I'm all for it, since that kind of story is something interesting that was unfortunately left on the cutting room floor for Anasui, and having some kind of positive representation is always a good thing. As for the actual character themselves, Dragona may be my absolute favorite in the chapter. They're just as entertaining as Jodeo, and they have an incredible chemistry. Out of everyone, they're the one I'm looking forward to seeing the most in the future. The opening scene of the story shows Jodeo and Dragona's encounter with two police officers. They're pulled over, and the traffic stop eventually escalates to one of the officers sexually assaulting Dragona. Jodeo intervenes by using his stand, which we later learn is called November Rain. As far as designs go, I'm a big fan of this stand. It's the first time that a part has had a really strange-looking stand like this be the protagonists, with the closest exception probably being Tusk, although that eventually became a more traditional stand near the end. The stand's name is based on the song by Guns N' Roses. A lot of people were able to predict this, based on the Ultra Jump cover illustration showing the word November on Jodeo's design. Its ability seems to be to spew out extremely heavy raindrops. The cops get absolutely flattened by this, so it makes me wonder what kind of limitations or other uses this ability has. Dragona also shows off their ability here, a stand named Smooth Operators. It's a colony stand made up of little robot-like beings with treads. They use their arms to rearrange parts of an object. They first use this to move the cop's eyes around to the side of his head so he can't aim. Later, they're seen using it to lift up and change the letters of a license plate and to make a fake ID. It's named after the song Smooth Operator by Saeed, who was previously referenced in parts 4 and 8 for her album Love Deluxe. The encounter ends with both cops knocked out and Jodeo burning the police car. The chapter gives us a bit of backstory about Jodeo's family. He describes his mother Barbara Ann and how he and Dragona protect her from the shadows. Their parents moved to Hawaii from Atlantic City, the same place mentioned in Part 8's final chapter, which described Joseph getting a job in an Atlantic City casino where he met Susie Q. Barbara Ann is their daughter, along with Part 8's Holly. Something I find interesting is there seems to be a pretty substantial gap between Holly and Barbara Ann's ages. 
We don't know for sure, but we can get an idea by comparing the ages of their respective children. For example, in 2011, Yoshikage Kira was 29 years old. By comparison, Dragona is 18, and presuming the JoJo Lands takes place around 2023, they would have been only 6 years old at the time of JoJolian. That's quite a large gap, so it makes me wonder if that'll end up being relevant later on. Barbara Ann is a completely new character to us, and she wasn't present on the Joestar family tree that we saw early in JoJolian. So perhaps once we learn more about the character, we can get an idea for why. Also, just as another bit of trivia, Barbara Ann's name appears to be a reference to a song by the Regents. Next, we see Jodio on a bus to school, where he does a drug deal with an upperclassman. He goes over how, as a child, he was paid by people to carry out simple tasks of delivering objects, which in reality was him acting as a drug mule. He refers to his role in that arrangement as a mechanism. He describes these mechanisms as a universal constant, where all the exchanges of power and trust in the world weave together like an ecosystem. He says that these mechanisms will create a flow of wealth to him, which is how he plans to become rich. He also describes a kind of apex of these mechanisms that he hasn't seen yet, and that mechanisms will start to appear as forms and shapes. This whole mechanism idea seems to be this part's version of the overarching systems in the JoJo series. For example, gravity and its role in fate is one of these systems. Jojolian expanded on this by describing fate as a flow, which is pushed and pulled by two opposing forces in a kind of yin and yang relationship the powers of the blessings, and the forces of calamity. These mechanisms are similar. I think now we're going to see the flow broken down to the most minute details, where each minor action slowly compounds into something that alters the course of fate. The way that he describes these mechanisms as forms and shapes takes us back to the first page, where stands are described in the same way. So it seems that these mechanisms will end up taking the form of stands or more likely, that stands themselves are made up from these mechanisms in the first place. What this reminds me of the most is the Steel Ball Run Extra chapter, what I consider to be one of the most important chapters in the JoJo series. This short chapter went over some general rules for stands, but also established how all powers in the series originate from the same type of energy. We see this with Hamon and Spin both being interlinked with stands but it also goes into the idea that stands originate from particles that appear from nothing. These particles are also what make up concepts such as matter and gravity. As we know already, gravity is just another word for fate. I'm thinking the Jojo Lands is going to elaborate on this idea once we learn some more about these mechanisms. After this, we learn about another new character, Paco Laburantis. He works together with Jodio on his drug deals, but they aren't really friends. He's 19, but still in high school, and has had a troubled past with his father, who abused him and bit out a piece of his ear. Paco is a kleptomaniac and steals anything he can get his hands on using his stand ability. The stand is called The Hustle, named after the song by Van McCoy in the Soul City Symphony. This lets him manipulate his muscles, which he uses to pick up objects without using his fingers. That's all we see of it in this chapter, but as Jodio's narration says, he'll explain more about the power when it's used again. As of now, the stand has no manifested form, and we just see the effect it has on his muscles. Our next new character is Meryl Mei Chi, the boss of the group who is also their high school principal. She's a giant woman who towers over the other characters. Meryl is described as a person who has multiple side hustles. She's a fashion designer, an investor in the boutique, a high school principal, and also a career criminal. Alongside that, she apparently has a handsome husband and a child at home. Jodio describes her as a crazy superwoman. Something funny about Meryl is that despite being a serious criminal, she still chastises and bosses around the others in a way a principal would. She tells the group that she's gotten knowledge of a $6 million diamond that is flying into Hawaii with a wealthy Japanese tourist. The person will be staying at their villa on the main island of Hawaii for two weeks and she asks the group to steal it for a percentage of the profit. The fact that a Japanese character is making an appearance is going to immediately set off some ideas about a possible returning character from Jojolian. If we go back to early in Jojolian's run, the Higashikata family mentions planning a vacation to Hawaii. It was cancelled since Hato forgot to get her passport, but perhaps we could finally see one of them here. Of course, there's always the possibility of this not being related to Jojolian at all, but it is an interesting idea to think about. 
Meryl mentions that three people is too small for the job and introduces a fourth member, the student that Jodie O'Dealed to earlier. So far we don't know this character's name, but he was featured prominently on the Shibuya Station mural advertising the part. So far he seems like an entertaining and eccentric character, which is my favorite type of character in the series. So hopefully he ends up having some relevance. At the end of the chapter, Jodio mentions that Meryl was right about three people not being enough, and that any amount of people wouldn't have been enough for this job. The last page then shows us the three stands introduced in the chapter, which is where we learn their names. The upcoming heist is something I'm definitely excited to see, and based on Jodio's foreboding narration, something bad is probably going to happen. As for what, I have no idea. That's one of my favorite things about Araki's stories. Despite having so much to say about it, I can't truly predict what's going to happen next. When it comes to first impressions, I think this part is nailing it. We have what I consider to be an excellent main protagonist, as well as what's shaping up to be a great supporting cast. The interactions we've seen between the characters have been really compelling, and I'm already growing attached to them. On top of that, I'm enjoying the variety of new stands, and the system of mechanisms that's been described promises to both expand on the powers introduced before in the series while also bringing up entirely new ones, which is a special interest of mine when it comes to JoJo. And finally, this story just seems like it's going to be really fun. I'm dying to read the next chapter, and hopefully you also feel the same way. With this, we finally entered a brand new era for JoJo. But the JoJo Lands isn't the only thing we're getting lately. For the past year, the spin-off manga Crazy Diamond's Demonic Heartbreak has been doing a great job of holding us over. Despite this, I think a lot of people still aren't really familiar with it. This story's set shortly before Part 4 and stars Josuke and Whole Horse. It's written by Kohei Kodono, author of the Purple Haze Feedback Light novel, and illustrated by Tasuku Karasuma, creator of the manga No Gun's Life. So far, it's been a really fun story, and I'm especially a fan of how it follows up on some characters from Stardust Crusaders a decade after their story took place. I've been reviewing it monthly since it began, and now we're seeing both it and the JoJo Lands releasing at the same time in Ultra Jump. For at least a few more months, it's going to be jam-packed with JoJo content. Once the newest chapter is translated, I'll be reviewing it as well, so I hope you'll check the manga out. A few months from now, we're also going to see the release of a new movie for the JoJo series, adapting the story Rohan at the Louvre. This movie is following up on three seasons of the Rohan TV drama, which I consider to be one of the best things to come out of JoJo in the past few years. Having it grow enough to actually get its own full movie is really exciting, and I'm hoping to cover it as soon as possible after it debuts in May. Overall, things are shaping up to be really big for JoJo this year. If you want to stay updated on everything, you can join the Hum and Beat Discord using the link in the description. If you support the channel on Patreon, you can also receive rewards like Discord perks, uncut videos, and the opportunity to submit questions. This video's question comes from Kauri. They ask, what pushed me to make this channel? Well, I first started making JoJo videos all the way back in summer of 2015, immediately after the end of the Stardust Crusaders anime. I would say that was my peak of excitement for JoJo, experiencing the manga for the first time, while also having the possibility of seeing it all adapted in the future. JoJo is my favorite series across any media, so I think I just felt I needed to be a part of it in some way. Thankfully, it's become a very fun and rewarding thing for me to do, and it gives me a great opportunity to help other people understand the series, while also expanding my own knowledge of it in the process. If you want to submit a question, just join any tier on the Patreon and you could submit as many questions as you like. I hope to answer at least one question per video, so any amount is appreciated. Thank you for watching. This is the part of the video where I thank my $5 and up patrons. Thank you to Alex Ramirez, Doorbell, Ashton Joseph Miller, Crayon, Rigovids, Zucato, Sentai, Pumpkin Doge, Mero, Almighty Quarth, Oof, Kauri, Halil, Gatlin Grove, Lime Jinjo, 17 Hit Combo, Phantom Kai, Sponge Cake, Kakext, Feliciano Robaja, Rayana Meme, Christian McDonough, Navi, Reed Go Beyond Jojolian on AO3, and Emmanuel Etienne.